Hello everyone, it's Benny, and today I'm making an update on the Advanced Redstone Computer Series. Where it is, where it's going, and why have I been making so few videos recently? Well, I'm going to start by talking about where the series is, because, at, believe it or not, the series is coming along really, really well at this point. The first episode might be coming a lot sooner than you would expect. I have definitely not forgotten about this series. I've been doing more work than you'd probably believe into making this as best I can, just by doing research, by building different things, by experimenting, and seeing how far I can push Redstone in terms of computing. And I'm pretty satisfied with what I've come up with so far. So, to start the video off, I'm going to be showing you my prototype CPU. That's right, this is the actual CPU we may or may not be using in the Advanced Redstone Computer Series. It's right here, the thing in front of me. And this thing, it's actually pretty small considering it's a 16-bit CPU, but as I said, it is 16 bits. This thing is... I'm pretty happy with it. I could maybe shave one tick off of it if I could do some interesting synchronization. Haven't decided if I'm going to do that or not yet. And I know, you're thinking, hey, one tick. What's one tick going to matter in the whole scheme of a computer? Well, once I tell you how fast the thing is, you'll see why one tick is quite an accomplishment. Because, as I said, I've been doing lots and lots of research, and I've been doing lots and lots of experimenting, and this thing right here is pretty close to the upper limit of how fast redstone computers can get. So, yeah, this is pretty ridiculous right here. But first, a demonstration. So, right here, this is my instruction input. And actually, I should explain that first, because I haven't made a video over that. I've been doing so much work, I forget what I've been saying and not. It's... yeah. But anyways, first off, let's talk about how the instructions work, because, yeah, so, I mentioned in a previous update that I was planning on making my own redstone instruction set. And that's exactly what I have right here. This instruction set, well, I had four goals in mind when I was designing it. First off, I wanted to create a really, really simple instruction set. In the sense that I wanted it to be really easy to sit down and just program it. I wanted it to be very intuitive. I didn't want to make it so you had to learn 10 billion exceptions to various rules. I wanted it very, very simple and straightforward. And I think I did a pretty good job of doing that. It's pretty, really simple. But at the same time, goal number two, I wanted it to be extremely powerful. And I think I did a pretty good job of that too. This instruction set is it can do pretty much anything you would ever, ever want to do with a Redstone computer. It's really, really powerful. But I had a few, few more goals than that, because, you know, most instruction sets can do that fairly simply. So in addition, I also wanted it to be really easy to decode. And considering it's a 16-bit instruction set, I think I did a fairly decent job of that. If I go down here, this thing right here is the decoder for my instruction set. As you can see, it's really fairly small for a 16-bit decoder, and yeah, so it does not need a lot of decoding. It's, the decoder for it is pretty small, and it's pretty fast, too. So, there. But, finally, and most importantly, the most important goal I had in mind when I was building this instruction set was I wanted it to be universal. What I mean by that is, I wanted this instruction set to be very, very easy to set up to run on any redstone computer, no matter how big, no matter how small, no matter how fast, how slow, how powerful, how simple, how advanced. I want it to be very easy to use with anything that was already out there. Because that means if I, we had the single universal instruction set that worked extremely well with any redstone computer, we can just all write programs in that one single instruction code, and then that will work with any redstone computer. Meaning, 
all your programs for Redstone Computer don't suddenly become obsolete when all of a sudden, oh hey, there's this new big fancy, more powerful computer out there that makes everything you did obsolete. You have to redo everything you did. I think that's really a big obstacle to software development in Minecraft. So, that was one of my really big goals with this. And I'm really happy with how it turned out. You can hook this thing up to pretty much... I mean, seriously, you can just take this decoder right there and plug that into pretty much any rest of computers that already exists, and it'll work beautifully. It's really, really universal. It's And it applies to really simple and really advanced computers at the same time. So, yeah. That's my instruction set, and it's what my processor over there uses. So, yeah. Now, now that you hopefully know a little bit more about my instruction set, I'm going to show you a little bit of how to use it. Now, I'd love to sit down and tell you a little bit more about how to use my instructions, but unfortunately I can't do that without making the video ridiculously long. So, instead, I'm just going to demonstrate how my instructions work. But first, one final note about my instructions. They do have a name. The a term comes from just how universal the instructions are, how they can be applied to so many different redstone computers in so many different situations, and just, yeah, how universal it is, how it has such a wide diversity of applications in redstone computing. In fact, the term was coined by a fellow RDFer named Nuomaster, so big thank you for this name because it's amazing. And the name of the instruction set is the Standard Redstone Computer Instruction Set, or SRCIS, which can be pronounced Circus. So, very simple, very easy to remember, and I really like that name. So, yeah. So here's an example of me just running some simple operations with my processor using this instruction set. So, anyways, in my instruction set, there's four different types of instructions. Now, again, I don't have time to go over what every single function in my instruction set is, but for this demonstration, I'm going to be using two of them. The first is instruction type 1, and you select which instruction type with these two bits here. So what instruction type 1 does is you select a specific function to perform with these five bits here, and if I set it at 0, that's just doing addition. You select a register, I'm going to select register 1, so I'm going to be adding whatever's in register 1, so adding register 1, and what I'm going to add to that is some constant, which is defined by these six bits here. So I'm going to send in a 5. Actually, no, I'll send in a 3. So I'm going to send in a 3 to register 1. I'm going to be adding 3 plus whatever's in register 1, rather. And since register 1 currently has nothing in it, this is just going to add 0 plus 3 and save that to register 1. So that should just give me 0. So, all I have to do now is I have to tick the clock. So tick, and as you can see, I now have a 3 in my data bus. So, the 3 has been saved. So, now I'm going to send a 5 to register 2. Now, again, I'm technically adding whatever is in register 2 plus 5, but since register 2 is empty, that's 0 plus 5, which ends up being just 5. So I'm going to be sending 5 to register 2. So if I hit save, or just tick the clock, tick, and now I have a 5. So there you go. So that's the first type of instruction. It just takes some register and does some operation with the data in the register. Now the other type of instruction we're going to be using is instruction type 0. In instruction type 0, you have two different registers, whichever two registers you choose, and you do some operation between those two registers. So an example would be maybe you take register 2 and add it to register 1. And in fact, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So I'm going to take register, actually I'm going to take register 1 and add it to register 2. So, there we go. That should be adding register 1 plus register 2. And now we have to choose where we want to save it. I'm going to save it to register 3. So, uh, I'm just going to... Yeah, okay, that's right. So, just tick the clock. So, tick. 
And it appears my AOU has derped. And again, this is a prototype for a reason. My AOU design right now currently drops blocks on occasion. So, yeah. But don't worry, I actually have a design, another AOU design, which does not drop blocks. So hopefully that'll work out a little bit better. And it appears there's another dropped block somewhere, because this should be giving us 8. So I'm going to go back into the AOU, figure out where else we have a dropped block, and we have a dropped block right there. Now we have 8. So, again, it's a prototype for a reason, not perfect. And that happens every now and then, but yeah. So now we have 8. It's working absolutely fine now. Now one effect of this instruction set is the processor, the way I have it set up, it will continue executing the instruction until you send it a blank instruction. So now it's just continually executing that instruction forever until I set my instruction to zero and tick the clock. And now it should... Okay, the server was lagging. It should be back. So let's look at our registers. This right here is register 1. As you can see, it has th three we saved. This right here is register 2. From the pistons being extended, you can tell it has 5 saved. And this is register 3. As you can see from the piston being extended, it has 8 saved. So, the whole thing is working beautifully, except for the minor derp. But again, I already have a new AOU design that doesn't do that, so I'm just going to be using that instead. Very, very simple and easy fix. And, um, yeah. So, that's my processor and my instruction set in action. And, like I said, it's 16 bits, and with my new ALU, it actually should shave one tick off the overall processing speed. So, that begs the question, exactly how fast is this thing? Well, I've done lots and lots and lots of work of trying to make a processor as fast as it can possibly be. That's what I've devoted a lot of the time of the past two months to. And... I've gotten a really, I think, really good speed for a processor, and I'm pretty happy with it, and even though my new AOU design should, in theory, allow for another tick, even if it doesn't, it, I'm really happy with how it is right now. So, the moment you've all been waiting for, how fast is this thing? Is it, maybe it's the speed of a red game too, is it 35 ticks? No. Not quite. Okay. Maybe it's a little bit faster. Maybe it's around, say, 20 ticks. That's pretty fast, right? Nope. Believe it or not, this whole processor, this whole 16-bit processor, has a maximum data throughput of 10 ticks. Now, I'm not even kidding you. And you have every right not to believe me if you don't want to, because that is a fairly fantastical claim. But yeah, this whole thing can process data in 10 ticks. And you might be thinking, oh, I understand that. You just made it so it does only, like, half a command every cycle, right? No. In those 10 ticks, it accomplishes more than most Redstone computers accomplish, even with their much longer cycles. In those 10 ticks, with all the hardware I have right now, and again, remember, this is a prototype, with all the hardware I have right now, in those 10 ticks, it is doing... The data can pass completely through the ALU, no matter how ridiculous your function is with the ALU. It can pass through the ALU. It can run through the busing to memory. It can go into memory. It can go through memory. It can be read back out from memory. And it can go back to the ALU. All in those 10 ticks. So, as it stands... As it stands, wow. As it stands right now, this ALU can do four operations in those that 10 tick cycle. That is ALU. The CPU can do ten, four operations in this 10 tick cycle. It is... Yeah, someone really needs to remind me to not record videos late at night. <laughs> but, yeah. So, this thing is ridiculously fast. By the time we're done with it, it'll have much, much more hardware to be able to do functions in that time. So, in the 10 tick cycle, nothing we sh should do should actually hurt that 10 cycles, as far as other than what I have here. So, we actually should be able to do as many as 10 commands in a 10 cycle. And again, I have a new ARU which is actually faster than this. So, 
it's possible to get 10 commands in a 9 tick cycle. That is. not commands, functions. That is absolutely ridiculously fast for a Resto computer, and that's really approaching the limit of how fast a Resto computer can go. And again, I'm not even using any fancy tricks in doing this. There's no instant wire going into this, it's all raw busing. There's no fancy glitch, glitchophonic logic going in there, there's just regular, highly optimized logic. And I've discovered a lot of tricks for minimizing the speed of a CPU when I've been doing all this. And I'm hoping to be able to share that with you guys, because that way, if you don't like the way I design it, or if you want to make one of your own a design one day, you'll know how to make a really, really fast CPU design. So yeah. And that's really all I wanted to show you. I've d designed the CPU. Unfortunately, all my research on developing a really efficient CPU has cut into the time I'd planned spending researching a good GPU, so I might actually delay the GPU portion of the series, unfortunately, but, you know, that's how things go. So, yeah. Now, the only other thing I guess I can show you is my new AOU design. So, one moment. So, this right here is my new AOU design, and hopefully the AOU design that I use in my Advanced Resto Computer series. It is, as you can see, pretty small, but more importantly, it is ridiculously fast. It is, it, at the absolute slowest, three ticks. That's it. That's how ridiculously fast this AOU is. Yeah, you want to know why I haven't been making so many videos recently? It's because I've been doing research into making components as small and fast as possible, as evidenced by this AOU and my CPU over there. So, yeah, this thing is ridiculously fast. And I'd like to give th thanks to Hink9600, a fellow RDFer, for showing me the specific method I used for getting it to be three ticks. It's a very, very clever and interesting method, and I would he's the one who showed it to me. I did not come up with it, so I don't know if he came up with it either, but I know he's the one who showed it to me. So thank you, Hink9600, because this AOU would not exist without you. So, yeah. So, first off, it is ridiculously small. It is... let's see... how should I write down? I forgot. 16 by 17 by 10. It's actually technically 17 by 17 by 10 because I added a little bit more to it. And it also doesn't have the right shifter on it yet. But even still, this thing is ridiculously small. And, like I said, it's ridiculously fast. Now, you do have to do a bit of a trick to get it to be three ticks. Because it takes advantage of the fact that pistons instantly retract to actually get the three tick speed, so what you have to do is when you put in data, so I'm going to put in 5 plus 3 like I did before, so there you go, 5 plus 3 is 8. If I want to input new data or if I want to change the data somehow, what I have to do is I have to first hit the clock line. All that will do is that will clear whatever data is already in the AOU, and now I can change the data to anything else I want, so 1 plus 7, which should still be 8, so actually just to make it more interesting, 3 plus 7, which should be 10, and now if I unclock it, it should give me 10. And yeah, there's no way I can get over there in time to actually show you that, but yeah, there you go. So that's what this clock line's for. And the trick in using the clock line is just make sure you hit it two ticks before you input the data, at least, because it takes two ticks for the AOU to reset itself. So yeah. And you might think, well that's not really truly three ticks if it has to take time to reset itself, is it? Well, no. You can't use it consistently at three ticks, but in a computer you would never be able to get something consistently at three ticks anyways. So really, this is it's for three ticks for any practical application. Now, if you don't want to do the clock line, it's 4.5 ticks, so you don't have to actually necessarily use this. You still get a pretty fast AOU, even without all the instant wire stuff. But yeah, so pretty cool AOU design. I'm quite happy with it. And yeah, so there you go. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned, and um, see you next time. Which 
may or may not actually be in the Advanced Redstone Computer Series, because it's coming up really soon at this point. So, thank you. See you next time. Oh, wait. I've to stop recording before I disconnect. Alright, thank you. See you next time.